Hello there, a very good evening and welcome to another edition of The Role of Law. Now, continuing our discussion on um, important legal matters, of course, that the general public of Sri Lanka should be aware of, in this time and age, there is huge influence in geopolitics uh, and uh, the globalization of, of the world has really impacted Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka or Sri Lankans need to know the impact of international law in Sri Lanka. Is it really binding? Should we be concerned about the agreements that we enter into with other countries and multilateral organizations? Now, to discuss these matters and more uh, issues surrounding international law and its effects here in Sri Lanka, we have with us uh, attorney at law Minura Ahangama, uh, who is a lecturer at the Royal Institute on uh, uh, international law and of course he currently also continues lecturing students uh, a very good evening sir and welcome to the show my pleasure thank you for having me. Um, so first questions first is international law really binding on us all as uh, domestic law is so Shalom that's a, a deep conversation if I may say hmm. we can't really uh, look at a particular treaty or convention or any agreement per se and decide whether it is binding directly hmm. or not. Hmm. Before we go into the binding aspect or the binding nature of an agreement, hmm. there are a few other things that we have to follow. Hmm. And these things have been given to us or entrenched upon us hmm. through certain very valid documents. Hmm. And now what I'm trying to get at is the United Nations hmm. and its impact on agreements and treaties that happen amongst countries. Hmm. So this is government to government? Absolutely. Right. So if you take international law, it is mainly of two types, hmm. private and public. Hmm. Private international law applies to organizations dealing with countries hmm. or organizations dealing with other organizations where the two parties are situated in two different countries. Hmm. Whereas if it is public international law, we do take into account mainly countries dealing with countries hmm. or where there is some sort of a, uh, a constitutional or hmm. a government involvement hmm. in that particular agreement. Right. So international commercial agreements fall under private international law and government-to-government uh, -government dealings under public? In a simpler sense, yes. Right. right. Um, now, International law is nothing like the domestic law mm. to start off with. Mm. The domestic law, I would say, is a little bit well structured or mm. better structured because it's all given in black letter. Mm. And furthermore, we also have to keep in mind that there is an uh, institution mm. to uphold it and also to look into the enforceability of the law. Mm. Whereas a proper court structure, hmm. prisons, police, everything. However, in international law, we can't really say the same. Hmm. The enforceability is questionable based on the, the nature of the country hmm. and the nature of the agreement. However, the statute of the ICJ, now this hmm. is the, the one of the very first uh, uh, legal terms I'm going to use. Right. The, the statute of the ICJ, hmm tells us what the sources of international law are. Right. As you and I both know, the sources of domestic law would be the constitution, the statutes, the judgments and whatnot. However, in international law, mm. under Article 38, mm. we can see that conventions hold the topmost priority mm. and then you get customary international law, mm. judicial decisions and even writings of other publicists. Hmm. So those are the, the, the aspects or the sources of international law that you can easily find. Right. So uh, speaking of uh, what affects Sri Lanka the most or what people here in Sri Lanka really talk about the most, um, it's international conventions, agreements, treaties that we enter into in, uh, with other countries, especially uh, namely uh, some, some free trade agreements, uh, the Singapore-Sri Lanka free trade agreement, uh, the India-Sri Lanka free trade agreements, and also especially uh, one agreement that was uh, broadly spoken of in the past uh, was uh, the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord. Uh, speaking on, on these agreements, uh, we will uh, speak, the, uh, speak of them in depth as we go along. But first, uh, could you explain the, uh, the required components of an international agreement? What yes. generally do we see in an international agreement? I think that's the best way to start this conversation. Hmm. So um, the, there are a few very vital set of principles that govern 
treaties or conventions. You can call it either one of them. Hmm. Uh, the main thing is treaties or, or even agreements. Absolutely. Right. The main thing is all of these, however you name it, hmm. have to be entered into with the other party's consent. Hmm. So what I'm trying to say here is you cannot force another country hmm. into entering into an agreement or a convention or right. a treaty. There are certain exceptions, the Rambule Accords would be one, hmm. but in today's day and age, we do not uh, go for those kind of tra tra trade agreements or any agreement. Right. So number one, consent is a must. Hmm. Because there is consent, we also have to go by this particular maxim or mm -hmm. this particular uh, uh, theory mm -hmm. called Pacta Sunt Savanda, mm -hmm. in which the two parties who have entered into the convention mm -hmm. have to uphold it no matter what. Right. However, having said that, there are once again exceptions where you can mm -hmm. breach an agreement or a convention based on other reasons such as national security, public interest and mm. whatnot. Right. So those are the main main principles that you have to remember. Mm. Having said that there are yes obviously there are other components that should be in a treaty, mm. such as the, the definitions, the subject matter, the purpose. Mm. And since recent past, yes we also have a term mm. for the convention. How long will it last? Correct. Hmm. But if there's a particular purpose, as long as the purpose is fulfilled, you don't really need to mention a term. Right. Um, however, traditionally, hmm. conventions and treaties did not have a term. So it was like a constitution, pretty much. You right. make it, it's there forever. Right. But now, yes, countries do include a term. Or most of the time, they would prefer to include a term or at least a particular provision that basically says for how long this particular agreement will run for. So could you briefly walk us through the procedure of how an international agreement, uh, an international accord, a convention, a treaty is ratified here in Sri Lanka and brought into law or made into law in Sri Lanka? Right. So before we get into that, I need to touch up on a particular uh, point mm -hmm. or, or a term, mm -hmm. terms if I may say, monism or monist countries mm -hmm. as well as dualist countries. Right. Monist countries in its simplest sense mm. is where international law is directly incorporated in their national setup. Right. Whereas in dual states, you need to ratify or mm. accept that particular international law mm. by way of a parliamentary act or something along those lines. Mm. So Sri Lanka has been, because we had a, a, a constitutional break, mm. We do have a provision in our constitution which requires certain types of agreements mm. to be ratified mm. or in other words to be accepted into our national legal system that mm. can be found in article 157 of our constitution. Mm. Having said that, that article specifically mm. limits these agreements to economic agreements. Right. Therefore. Article 157 would most likely apply only to hmm. economic agreements and Article 157 quite clearly also states that there should be a two-thirds parliamentary majority. Hmm. And in the event it needs to be breached, hmm. that can only be done if there is any threat to national so security. Hmm. So these are the, 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 the basic or the outline of what we should keep in mind as Sri Lanka. So, when Sri Lanka enters into an agreement with an international partner, you mentioned that there are certain instances where uh, these agreements can be breached, uh, such as national security or public interest. But given a state where it's breached for some other reason, um, what's the enforceability, what are the consequences? So, conventions are pretty much like contracts that have been entered into between two countries. Hmm. That's the simplest definition one can give. Hmm. A constitution is a contract between two countries. Right. Now, if you enter into a contract with another person, that contract would most likely have provisions which state out the consequences of a breach. Hmm. So, similarly, conventions will also have the same thing. Hmm. Having said that, 
certain conventions do not have this hmm. because of the, the diplomatic connections the two countries have and they trust each other so much, they feel like, okay, we don't need to really have consequences in this. Hmm. So those kind of conventions can be quite uh, uh, a friendly ones, if I may right. say. However, um, if I am correct, Article 102 hmm. of the United Nations Charter quite specifically states any international agreement hmm. entered into between two countries must be registered at the United Nations headquarters. Right. If not, that convention will not have any legal effect in any of the institutions run by the United Nations. These institutions run by the United Nations being? The ICJ, hmm. which is kind of considered as the, the world court. Hmm. So I, I would say yes, the ICJ. Right. So, moving on, uh, one uh, convention or an accord that uh, was discussed broadly during the past, especially uh, with India coming in and requesting or uh, demanding that Sri Lanka fulfill their end of the bargain as per this accord was the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord. Uh, now, just a brief precursor uh, to the discussion is the fact that uh, the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord was entered into between India and Sri Lanka, uh, between uh, Prime Minister, I beg your pardon, President J. R. Jayawardena and Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, and following which uh, it resulted in the 13th Amendment to the Constitution being introduced. There was a broad discussion on if Sri Lanka really needs this 13th Amendment, the provisions in the 13th Amendment, but of course, uh, we have given an undertaking to India that we will involve in devolution of power. Speaking specifically about this Indo-Sri Lanka agreement, could you give us a brief understanding of what this really means? And uh, the most important question being, do we really have to abide by these uh, agreements or by this specific agreement when we draft a new constitution? All right, so I am afraid I won't be able to give you a yes or no answer for this. Hmm. But let's go through the contents of the agreement first. Right. It was, I, yes, it was entered into in 1987 hmm. on the 29th of July hmm. between the heads of state of the two countries. The key thing to remember here is, among other things obviously, the most essential provision hmm. of this accord was desiring to prevent the unity, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Sri Lanka. Hmm. Because obviously, as we all know, there was a problem back in the day. Hmm. However, having said that, you must keep in mind, is that problem applicable today? Hmm. However, there are other things in the, in the accord, which is the, the almost the, the, the catalyst hmm. of the creation of the 13th Amendment. Hmm. And furthermore, the Indian peacekeeping forces or the deployment of the Indian peacekeeping forces in Sri Lanka, right. in those hostile areas. Hmm. The last thing that I just told you, did not really work well. Hmm. Yes, the Sri Lankan army, the government did keep to their word, went hmm. back into the barracks hmm. and did not do anything that breached this agreement. Hmm. However, that was not the case from the terrorists. Hmm. They made sure that they gained as much as land they would want in hmm. that given period. So in their attempt, obviously there were fights between the Indian peacekeeping forces and the terrorists. Right. That led to the peacekeeping forces withdrawing and going back to India. Hmm. So one of the key features or key components of the accord was never properly done. Hmm. On the part of India? Yes, on the part of India. And that was not anyone's fault. Hmm. I mean, I would say that's the terrorist's fault, but not the, not the, not the party's fault. Right. right. So having said that, like I told you earlier, yes, we do have the 13th Amendment. Hmm. A lot of people do criticize it, but yes, there are a lot of good things that came out of it as well. Mm. We all have these code structures and whatnot mm. based on provinces because of that. And right. that's the most practical thing to do. Right. However, there are certain other issues mm. that can be pointed out in this particular uh, agreement, right. such as devolution of powers and uh, uh, considering the eastern and the northern provinces as one, mm. all of that. So, let's not get into the, the political aspect of it, mm. but as an agreement or a convention, now our question is, is it applicable to us today? Mm. A, uh, an agreement can be breached for many reasons, mm. or it can be terminated for many reasons. 
one adequate or necessary or I would say relevant reason here would be mm. fundamental changes in circumstances. Because take a look at how things were back in 1987 and take a look at it now. Mm. Do we have the same circumstances? One of the key components of that particular mm. agreement was that the, the presence of a terrorism or a division in the country. But do we have that today? So if the, the, the circumstances have fundamentally changed, mm. do we then still have to hug this and wait? Mm. That's the other question we have. Mm. So let's, let's get into the, the other, other more technical details later on. But mm. basically the contents of this agreement mm. is pretty much that. Is there really uh, a chance or is there a threat that India might be able to enforce this agreement against us at some international body? Is there a possibility? Um, okay, so again, let's go back to Article 157. Hmm. A lot of people for this agreement, hmm. or who say that this agreement should be upheld hmm. and it should be considered valid even today, hmm. always refer to Article 157. Hmm. I'm sorry, the people who do not want, uh, want this agreement, right. go back to Article 157. Right. And they point out the fact that this agreement is not an economic agreement. Hmm. Yes, it is true. It is not an economic agreement. Like I told you clearly earlier, it was to, like the, like the agreement states, desiring to preserve the unity hmm. and territorial integrity of Sri Lanka. Hmm. So it has nothing to do with the economy per se. So, according to that, yes, this is not something that uh, needs to be taken into account mm. with regard to 157. Mm. So, having said that, mm. you never had to ratify it in the first place. Right. Because it never belonged to 157. Right. However, ratification can happen in other ways as well. Mm. Ratification can happen through the executive through cam cabinet memorandum mm. and uh, obviously subject to uh, corrections. I think, in, I think if my memory is correct, even the Attorney General mm. has given an opinion along those lines. How it is not mandatory mm. to refer to Article 157 right. with regard to a convention. Now, the, the question that you have been asking me from the beginning mm. is, is it valid today or not? Mm. One can say yes, one can say no. But the ones who say no will not fall into trouble. Hmm. Because first and foremost, even if we are breaching, hmm. what can the other party do? Hmm. That's question number one. The answer to that is, the accord does not provide any provisions that deal with the consequences. Right. So in that case, what are you going to do? Hmm. Number one. Secondly, this was never registered at the UN. Hmm. If that was the case, can they go to the ICJ against us? No, they can't. Article 102, sub-article 1, I think, hmm. and sub-article 2. Those two talk about specifically how these kind of conventions will have no legal effect in hmm. any of the institutions of the United Nations. Because it's not registered. Because it's not registered. Hmm. So in that case, like, like, you know, if, if, it's a, if it's a small fight between two little kids, hmm. one kid will be like, so what are you going to do? Right. What are you going to do? Hmm. Pretty much. So that's, that's the, the, the stalemate or that's the, the place where we stuck at. So uh, besides the diplomatic fallout, of course, between uh, the two nations, there is nothing legally uh, preventing Sri Lanka from moving away from this accord. Given the circumstances now, because of the absence of any consequences mm. and because of the non-registration, mm. I, according to my knowledge, can't pinpoint and say this is what is going to happen to us. Obviously, mm. yes, there will be diplomatic uh, issues between the two countries. Mm. But having said that, let me uh, point out a few things that happened in the world. Mm. The Prime Minister of India who mm. signed this, mm was killed by the LTT as well. Hmm. So since that day, hmm. 
the Indo Lanka Accords were really just happening from our side mm. because we went ahead then passed the 13th Amendment, made sure that all the languages are spoken and appreciated and mm. uh, accepted mm. even in official correspondence. Right. So we've done our part, I would say. Mm. But having said that, the Prime Minister was assassinated by the LTTE. Mm. So in that case, do they really want to go ahead with this agreement or do they still consider this valid because it was something to deal with something to do with a terrorist organization mm. or there was an involvement of terrorist organization mm. well another main issue that uh, has cropped up every now and again it comes up it goes down it comes up when the sessions come again is uh, the resolutions that were passed against sri lanka now resolutions are also another source of international law what kind of effect does resolutions have on a country Okay, so I'm really glad you pointed one thing out. Resolutions are a source of international law. Hmm. You are absolutely correct. However, that is not mentioned in Article 38. Hmm. Because Article 38 was created a long time back. Hmm. And resolutions were not really considered part and parcel of everyday international law. Hmm. However, that is the total opposite now. Hmm. We do consider resolutions, diplomatic correspondence, and so many other things mm. as sources of international law. Mm. One thing to remember is, now if we take the subject of dispute resolution, mm. yes, a dispute can be resolved in two ways, mm. judicially as well as diplomatically. Right. Judicially it would happen, especially speaking about international law, it would happen through the ICJ mm. or other arbitration bodies linked to the ICJ. Hmm. However, the United Nations General Assembly where the resolutions take place hmm. fall under the diplomatic category. Right. So these resolutions are not legally binding. Hmm. Yes, they are diplomatically highly persuasive. Yes, diplomatically other countries can gang up hmm. and force smaller countries like us to do or not do certain things. Hmm. However, key thing is that these are not at all hmm. legally or judicially binding on us or anyone who is part and parcel of the resolution. So the fact that we initially co-sponsored resolution 34-1 and now withdrawn from it really has no judicial effect on us? No, it, it doesn't have a judicial effect. But like I told you, we can't live alone in the world. Hmm. Obviously, we need the support and the, the assistance from all the other countries. Hmm. Now, let's say, okay, without naming names, hmm. let's say country A, B, C and D hmm. are friends with us. Right. And let's say A, B, C and D hmm. are also our biggest purchasers and also we buy from them. Hmm. Right? We, we basically sell whatever to them and they also sell things back to us. Hmm. If they come up with a resolution, hmm wanting us to change certain things in a different way mm. and if we go against that they wouldn't want to go into some court that has no real validation in the world mm. and be going for trials throughout years mm. no what they would instead do is they would cut the diplomatic relations the trade relations mm. that they have with us so i would say it's better to go into a judicial case because I mean, you can drag it for as much as you, you want, want and keep it the way you want hmm. if you have a good set of lawyers. Right. But having said that, diplomatic battles hmm. take the effect of a, a different, a dif different nature right. because yes, they can make or break a country. Hmm. Now, if I, if I take countries like China, hmm. India, hmm. US, UK, Israel, these countries can make or break other countries hmm. because of their validity, because of the strength they have, military, economic or whatever. Hmm. So anyone should be absolutely stupid to go head on with them. Hmm. So what is the best way to do? Why do you call it diplomacy anyway? You treat or deal with them in a diplomatic way. Hmm. So there is a thin line between being diplomatic and being arrogant. Right. So you have to know when to cross it and when not to cross it. Hmm. 
going back to what you asked me about 30 slash 1, hmm. yes, we did co-sponsor. Uh, again, without going into the political aspects of it, one, one main reason why I would see that is because hmm. we do not want to have any international enemies. Hmm. We had enemies in our country itself for over 30 years. Hmm. And why do we need people outside the country as well? Hmm. So yes, we might have agreed and we might have tried to achieve certain things that they proposed. Hmm. So that I think in my opinion would be just attempting to keep the world or the world leaders happy to a certain level. Right. Having said that, you should also know, yes, if we do enforce the recommendations given by those world leaders, hmm. would it affect our sovereignty, would it affect our territorial integrity, would it affect our supremacy of law? Hmm. If the answers to those are yes, then I think we should really get out of it. Right. If the answers to those are no or anything in line with that, then if it doesn't create any problem to us in the long run, hmm. our sovereignty, our territorial in integrity, hmm. our supremacy of the judges, the law, then I, w I, I, I mean, nothing can happen. So we're in the final few minutes of our show and I'd like to pose this question to you. Of course, uh, this is a lengthy discussion, but uh, it's been happening for some time. Uh, politicians in Sri Lanka always uh, come forward and, and, and uh, sometimes uh, tell the people that there is a threat of war heroes in Sri Lanka being taken to the International Criminal Court. If you could briefly explain the procedure to it uh, so that the people can actually understand as to if or if there is no threat of this really happening. So the moment the word court hmm. comes in, hmm. there is no real danger of immediate execution, right. obviously. Hmm. Anything happens after obviously giving in to the submissions of both sides. Hmm. It's a trial. Right. So just because now, let's say, you looked at me in a wrong way, hmm. I file some sort of intimidation or some file a case against you. Hmm. Does it mean you'll be punished immediately? No. no. You should be proven wrong. Until you are proven wrong, you are innocent. Right. Same thing applies everywhere. Hmm. So, yes, one may attempt to take our heroes hmm. to the ICC, hmm. but that does, I mean, first of all, that shouldn't be the case. Hmm. Because it was not a war that happened in our country, it was a, it was a civil conflict that led to so many other complications mm. and there was a presence of terrorists. Mm. When we are dealing with terrorists, I don't see that they do abide by the, the laws or the rules of the war. Mm. And you can't play a one-sided game with them mm. or you can't, you, can't play, you can't play a fair game with mm. them. So what I'm trying to say here is, first and foremost, no. Mm. Our war heroes, our soldiers, our generals should never be tried in the first place. Mm -hmm. Having said that, let's say somehow it does happen. Mm. Obviously, we have the best lawyers in the world. Mm. Obviously, we have not done anything wrong to be punished. Mm. So, it is up to the other party to prove that, okay, we have done something wrong mm. and we have it. So, even if it goes to that level, mm. I don't think there should be any immediate scare or threat or any, any sort of panic mm. because until and unless mm. prosecuted, convicted, we will not be termed as you know criminals or war criminals. We are not. Mm. So there is absolutely no, like I told you, I'll, I'll say this again 100 million times, <laughs> it won't happen overnight. Right. There is no real fear or threat. Mm. If that is the case, okay, let's face it and let's prove them wrong. That's about it. So, uh, regarding the history of convictions from the ICC, how, how many people really has it convicted? Uh, is it, does it happen quite often? So, the international court structure hmm. is pretty much like a sleeping lion hmm. without teeth, hmm. without claws. It's just a lion. Right. It has the name. In 1945, the UN was created. Hmm. Up until today, Mm. Uh, I think this my stats might be about six years old. Mm. However, the U the ICJ itself mm. has made only sixty to seventy judgments, mm. or given only sixty to seventy judgments over the course of so many decades. So many decades. 
having said that yes they have started a new thing which is giving advisory opinions hmm. that's pretty much like obiter dicta hmm. it's basically their opinion hmm. it's not legally enforceable it's it's not something that that can can you know lead up to anything worse hmm. like what happened in the the shegos archipelago di- recently hmm. right so all of that are just opinions but what i'm trying to say here is the international bodies or international court structure hmm. has been quite dormant or have been quite laid back because of a number of reasons reasons being it's it's quite expensive hmm. and also there should be consent hmm. again and it's it's a uh, very difficult to uh, the the judges involved hmm. in the icj their appointments the appointments as well as uh, a big big uh, criticism that they have is that they do not represent the world hmm. because the majority of the judges would either come from the, the european West. section or somewhere else or whatever so in that case the are the minorities really represented in these hmm. so because of these very valid reasons the hmm. international court structure has been quite uh, if i may say a sleeping lion right uh, well of course that's uh, all the time that we've got to discuss these broad issues of course uh, although not enough time uh, thank you very much sir for joining us on our show and clarifying these issues uh, especially for the general public to keep them informed to keep our viewers informed and that's a wrap of the role of law for today of course we will see you again same time same place next week thank you very much for tuning in until then take care and god bless <laughs>